BC. Let's stand up and worship our King with us this morning. I wish I could tell you, wish I could describe it. I can't contain it, can't keep it to myself. There aren't enough colors to paint the whole picture. Words to ever say what I found. He's wonderful and beautiful and glorious and holy. He is merciful and powerful. Who we're talking about? That's my king. We declare the glory. Give him all the honor. All together worthy. Who we're talking about? King. Yes, it is. Good morning, church. Good morning. Y'all looking good. Um, I came out here by myself today. Uh, I need to uh, admit something, confess something to you that uh, has had an impact on you and uh, has to do with my internet activities lately. Um, a couple weeks ago, I downloaded an app called Timu. Uh, if you don't know, Timu is kind of like uh, TikTok and the flea market had a baby. Um, I ordered off of Timu for 73 cents a brand new iPhone charger and like a 150 foot cable to charge my iPhone. And last Sunday before church, I went up to my office and I plugged it in and charged my iPhone. All the power went out. <laughs> what was that all about? Have y'all ever heard the craziest thing? Listen, if it's your first time here this week, we're glad you're here this week. But who I really want to talk to is the people who were here for the first time last week. What did y'all think when you pulled up and there was nobody here? Man, I missed y'all so bad, and I am so glad we get to get back together. Man, I had the worst week. My week has been terrible, and I attribute it all to not being able to worship with you guys, man, all week. Hey, I'll tell you something that can make your this week really, really neat. 
Do you know that OBC Worship uh, is on Spotify? You know, or Apple Music, wherever you get your music at, do you know that? Well, here's something you don't know. Their brand new single, Praise the Lord, you can pre-save that now, but here's what you have to do to do that. You gotta take your phone out and scan that QR code on the seat back in front of you. If you take your your phone out, scan that QR code, you can pre-save their new single, Praise the Lord. Man, I am so thankful that even on weeks when we don't get to worship together, I can still jam uh, with the OBC worship. Our God is on the move. I better listen to that song 25 times this week. Um, But man, pre-save that. You definitely uh, want to do that. And man, I'll tell you something else that was just struck me uh, this week as I was thinking about not being together on Sunday was this the generosity, the giving that so many people did on a Sunday when we didn't even gather together. I mean, it was amazing to me to see how mature our church body is where we don't see tithing as some price of admission. But then I started thinking, Man, what would it be like if more of us were that way? Like if more of us were regularly, sacrificially giving that way, how much ministry could we do here? I mean, it just amazed me. So maybe that's you. Maybe you're looking for a way to kind of step your game up in giving. There's all kinds of ways you can do that. You can scan that QR code. You can give on our app. Our giving kiosks are in the lobby. You can give like that. If you want to give by check or cash, there will be ushers at the doors with baskets. Um, As you leave, you can give that way as well. Um, You know, listen, I'm not from here. We chose to move here, and I love Eden, and I love our county, and I love our community. But can I be honest? Man, there ain't nothing to do here on Friday night. Okay, look, in two Fridays, we're going to have a great opportunity to come right here to attend the Hoppers and the Jason Crab concert. Man, you talk about top-notch gospel music. You are going to be amazed by how worshipful, how well done it is, how amazing the music is, what a great night it is. It's going to be fun. Um, it's going to be glorifying. We get an opportunity to do this right here at our home church. So you can get those tickets. Uh, you can go to our website or the app, scan the QR. QR code. Uh, you don't want to miss that. Man, I know you guys knew that something was off this morning when you walked in and there was no sermon outline. All right, so we are excited to have a guest speaker today. And I want to introduce you to a good friend of mine. Jeremy, come on out here. This is Jeremy Milligan. Most of you guys probably know. Yeah, that's right. Jeremy and Danielle and their family and man, now his parents have just been faithful OBC members for a long, long, long time. But Jeremy has a very special relationship with our guest speaker today. So Jeremy, let them know a little bit about what we're in for today. All right. Um, Like Jason said, my name is Jeremy Milligan. Uh, My wife's sitting over here, Danielle. We actually lead the Thrive Ministry here at Osborne. And Jason and I talked about that back in August about, you know, kind of taking over and leading the young adults here um, that are college and career age. And the first thing I thought of is, man, I got to get my friend Gary Miracle up here to share his story with our young adults. Um, One of the things that Gary shared with me was, you know, having his identity in Christ and then going through a medical, we'll call it a tragedy, um, and going through that. But having his identity in Christ is really what kind of pulled him through that. So I can't wait for you guys to hear his story today. We had a little event on Friday night. I was talking to Pastor Steve about that. And I said, hey, man, I'd love to get him up here to talk to these guys. And once Pastor Steve found out about his story, he's like, man, I need to get them or get him in front of the congregation. So I love the ministries here at Osborne. But four years ago, when all this happened, you know, we're part of a connection group. You'll hear Jason, you'll hear Stephen tell you all the time, get in a group. If you're at this church, get in a group. But four years ago, I saw a Facebook post from my friend's family said, basically, if you pray, pray for Gary because they've called in his friends and family. He's not going to make it. That's the end. So he's 30 years old, parent or father of four. I've known him since middle school. So we kind of grew up in the same church in Florida. And um, the first thing I did was called my connection group. And then the prayer team here at Osborne just poured over Gary with prayer. And I mean, they've never met Gary. Gary didn't even know Eden existed in North Carolina, but because of your faithful service and your faithful giving, you know, we had an outlet to, to just pour over Gary in prayer. So through all that, that's the connection for Gary to be here. So thank And he's you here preaching today, right? Man, speaking of prayer. Hey, let's continue to worship today. Um, you, you guys pray with me. We're in for a blessing today. God, thank you for the testimony of the power of prayer. Lord, we are uh, dependent on you. 
And Father, I pray that um, you look down on this body today. And God, you are pouring out your grace on us in that recognition of our inability to do anything without you. God, remind us who you are today. Remind us who we are today. God, I pray that you will remind us what you did to bridge that gap. I pray for Gary and his time. I pray that you will uh, fill him with your words and God, fill us more with your spirit as we continue to worship the great name of Jesus. And it is in that name that I pray, amen. Church, let's stand up and worship together. I want to ask you this this morning. Do you have anything to be thankful for today? Anything at all to be thankful for? I'm going to do something that uh, we don't uh, normally do. And I'm going to ask you to shout something out. And uh, I know we're Baptists, but I want you to do this for me. On the count of three, I just want you to shout out something that you're thankful for this morning. You guys ready for that? All right, something that you're thankful for on three. All right, everybody together, one, two, three. Isn't God good? Come on, together, let's thank him for his goodness. Let's sing this. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. And I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. Come on, sing that again, sing. I see the evidence Come on, your promises. I see
Has he been faithful, church? Has he never let you down? Been so faithful, and you've been so kind. I'm reminded of how you never let me down. You've been so faithful, you're so kind. Every morning, I see your mercies all around. You've been so faithful, you've been so kind, yeah, I'm reminded, oh, of how you never let me down. You've been so faithful, you've been so kind, every morning, oh, I see your mercies all around, so I should I feel all the evidence is here? Come on. Why should I feel the
Here we go. This is it. Listen, I'm a pacer when I talk, so just bear with me. All right, it's okay to laugh. This is going to be good. Okay, listen, y'all, we come together because we expect him to show up. You know, it's not the kind of thing where we cross our fingers and we hope that he shows up. It's the kind of thing because the body of Christ calls upon his name, so he's faithful to show up. So that means that every single one of you are standing or sitting in the presence of a holy God right now. That should blow your stinking mind. (laughs) And my name is Gary Miracle. I get the opportunity and the honor to come here and you know, I have a couple goals in mind while I'm doing this, y'all. I I wanna tell you why I look like this. I'm gonna be your token cripple person for the day. Uh, it's, uh, come on, people, you can laugh at these things. Uh, man, I just, I want to tell you what happened to me. Uh, my goal is to, is to make you laugh. I want to make you cry. I want to make you think. I want to make you feel anything that you want to or need to feel. Because what I do know for sure, what I know for a fact is that every single seat that is in this place right now that is empty right now, the seat that is potentially next to you that is empty, is empty on purpose. And it's empty for a reason. I don't know why. But the flip side of that is every single one of you sitting in the seat that you're in is because you're sitting here on purpose. And whatever it is you're going through, whatever baggage you brought into this room with you this morning, whatever your morning looked like, listen, I got kids. My Sunday morning, Satan Satan comes. Satan tries hard, right? So whatever you went through this morning, man, you are right on time. Yeah. With all of our crazy, with all of our ugly, with all of our mess, we're right on time. So listen, I'm going to dive right in, all right? So y'all just keep up. All right, so my name's Gary Miracle. I live in, in Florida, right outside of Orlando. Stinking Mickey Mouse is everywhere. And uh, there's that. But um, I, I, I'm 42 something, I think. I was born in 81. Do the math. I don't know. I gave up on numbers. But um, I was born in 1981. I was born in Pontiac, Michigan. When I was 10 years old, my dad's job took us down to to Florida, little Rockledge, Florida. Nobody's ever heard of it. And uh, lived there when I was 10 years old. And, you know, this was in 1991. And uh, my mom was at a laundromat one day. They, they had those <laughs> and we used them. Uh, uh, she was at a laundromat and some lady at the laundromat sparked up a conversation with her and invited her to church. And, and she came home and, and made me go with her. And so we went to church and, and then we made my sister come. And uh, Sunday mornings was, was lawn cutting day for dad. So he stayed home. Uh, he, he cut his grass. And then a couple months later, we convinced dad to come. And, and uh, our, our, our fierce family foursome hasn't missed a Sunday since. And I, I'm proud to say that. Uh, I, yeah, amen. Um, and my parents are some of the most, ha, ah, jeez. They're over there. I gotta be careful. <laughs> my parents are some of the most godly people I know. Um, my dad went from cutting grass on Sunday mornings to becoming my youth pastor all growing up. And uh, man, God, God's got a plan and we never know what that looks like. So uh, it was, uh, we, we started going to church, but uh, I, listen, I don't, uh, oh my gosh. Okay, here we go. I gotta keep talking fast. Um, as I was 11 years old in this little church at uh, Rockledge Baptist Church, and I was sitting in the third row pew on the right-hand side, and, and Pastor Randy Sensabaugh was on stage, and he was giving his little three- to five-minute call to worship, and, and my 11-year-old little brain w- was told that if I asked Jesus to come into my heart, then I can go to heaven one day, so I, I thought that would be cool. So I did that, and uh, I, I was sitting there, and it was on October 6th uh, at 7.16 p.m., Sunday night service. Uh, I accepted Jesus to come into my heart in that moment. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what, a, what, what kind of weight an 11 year old had on his shoulders, but it was gone. Uh, I think I felt, uh, and then I went there and then, uh, and then life also happened, right? So uh, what happened to me was I became what I called a, a professional chameleon. I was whoever I needed to be based on whoever I was with. 
And I got really stinking good at it. I became a phony, a fake for the most part. I was, I was at church on Wednesday. Well, this was in the 90s at a Baptist church. So I was at church on Wednesday nights and Thursday nights and Friday nights and Saturday nights. <laughs> we were always at church. But, but we were there. And man, when I was at church, I was the best Christian you could ever see. Imagine me with hands and I had them held high. And on Friday nights after the football games at high school, I was the guy at the parties holding the red Solo cup filled up with beer. Didn't take a sip because I thought it was disgusting. But I had to look that part. I had to do that. I had to fit in. And before long, year after year after year of, of trying to do this, I, I, I couldn't keep up with all the people that I was trying to be. And, and, and then I got fully exposed in who I really was. And, and then that was super confusing. <laughs> Uh, what I learned, and, I, and I'm going to speed this story up, but what I learned when I was, I was about 35, so this isn't that long ago, y'all. Uh, when I was about 35, 36 years old, I went through a little bit of what I call an identity crisis. I realized at that moment, since I was 11 years old, when I got that foundation in my life of Jesus, what really happened in my life is I really just basically took on the faith of my parents. I didn't have my own. I looked the part, I did what I needed to do, I did what made them look good, I did what made me look good, but I took the faith of my parents until I was 35, 36 years old and I realized, goodness gracious, like who am I? Who am I? Who is Christ? Who is Christ in me? What does that look like? So I called a mentor of mine and, and I told him, I'm like, dude, you, I, you, you have been through this and I need you to walk through this with me. So he did, uh, he linked arms with me uh, when I was 35 years old and and he shared a book with me, and we walked through this book together. And it, it took about six months for us to go through this book together. And uh, uh, while we were going through this book, he did something incredibly special in my life. And what would happen is I would wake up in the morning, and my mentor would send me a text message. And all the text message would say in the morning when I would wake up is it would say, Gary, you are holy, righteous, and redeemed. And I would wake up the next day and I would have a text message from my mentor and all that text message would say is, Gary, you are holy, righteous, and redeemed. Wow. And a couple days went by and, and I felt like, man, that's so encouraging. That's what I needed to hear. A couple weeks went by, I'd wake up to the same text message and I'm like, all right, dude, I get it. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> I'm holy, righteous, and redeemed. A um, month or two went by. And I would get that same text message, Gary, you are holy, righteous, and redeemed for six months. And what happened was at the end of that six months, I sat back in my seat and I was like, huh, I wonder if that's true. I wonder if who I am, what my identity is, is holy, righteous, and redeemed. And what I had learned is, is that that foundation that I started when I was 11 years old became a firm foundation when I was 35, 36 years old. And I, and I stopped just becoming a Christian and I dedicated my life to become a Christ follower. Yes. Amen. And I believe that there's a difference between those two things. I think it's super, super easy for us to walk into these doors every Sunday morning and wherever you come into these doors and we have that Christian mask on our face that just says, it's fine. Yeah, and we talk to each other and we say, how are you guys doing? It's fine, I'm fine, fine. Wife, kids, fine, fine as fine can be. I'm fine, how are you? Oh, you're fine, cool. Let's go sit down and worship. <laughs> yeah. You know, we have that mask on when, when underneath that mask, we're dying inside because nobody really knows who we are. And we're realizing that all the love that we're receiving, the only thing that's getting love is our mask, not us. So I was going through this process and I was realizing, man, am I genuinely holy, holy righteous, and redeemed? Is Galatians 6, 2, 20 actually true where I've been crucified with Christ, therefore it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. So right here, right now, y'all, y'all are not listening to Gary Miracle. You are listening to Christ in Gary Miracle. That is who I am. That is my identity. My identity is in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. But I still suck sometimes. Sorry, it's very foul language to use in front of a church. But life is hard. And who knew, all right, here we go, I'm diving into this. Who knew, when I was 39 years old, it was the day after Christmas, 2019, I woke up and I was feeling sick. 
It was flu season down in Florida. Well, I guess it was flu season everywhere, right? It was the day after Christmas. Uh, I, I, I wasn't feeling well. It was that last week of the year. You know, your, your primary doctor, they don't really hold typical hours. They're rich and on vacation. Sorry, doctors, if that's you out there. I don't know. Do your thing. You do you. You deserve it, I guess. Uh, so, I, I, don't, I don't know what. I just say things, so I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, primary doctor didn't hold regular hours. I took myself to the emergency room. Went to the emergency room, they got me in the back, they asked me a series of questions. At the end of that line of questionings, they told me I had the flu. They gave me a Tamiflu shot, they gave me a steroid shot. They told me, go home, get a lot of rest, drink a lot of water. If you're not better in 10 days, come back and see us again, right? We've all heard that a million times when we go to the doctor. Uh, Well, the next day I woke up and I was feeling drastically worse. Uh, bad enough where I actually took myself back to the emergency room for a second time. And, and, and I went in and, and they looked at me at that time and, and I was actually having an allergic reaction to the Tamiflu shot that they gave me the day before. Uh, so there was that. Uh, they gave me another steroid shot to counteract that. And they told me to go home, get a lot of rest, drink a lot of water. If I wasn't better in 10 days, come back and see him again. A couple days went by, I was feeling worse and worse and worse, but, but uh, I, I'm a man, <laughs> so, so I, had to, I had to buck up. Everybody was yelling at me, complaining like I had the man flu because I was like, I'm, I'm sick, I was just complaining the whole time. Uh, but it got so bad that I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna jump ahead to uh, one, listen, I'm gonna throw a lot of times at you right here, so, so track with me for just a second, but it was 1 p.m. on December 31st, 2019. New Year's Eve, I went back to the emergency room for the fourth time, so I skipped a visit there. I went back to the emergency room for the fourth time. And this time they looked at me and they rushed me back into a room and they put me on a bed and they hooked me up to some machines, 46 of them to be exact. They hooked me up to 46 machines and, and, and they looked at me after they got me hooked up and they looked at my family who was there and my friends who were there at the time and they let them know You need to call the rest of Gary's friends and the rest of your family because he's not gonna make it through the night. Like what? So much so that they gave me a 1.7% chance to live through the night on New Year's Eve. But praise God, a 1.7% chance doesn't stand up against our God, right? So my family did just that. They called everybody, they didn't know. I was dying slowly right in front of them. So they called everybody to come say goodbye. Well, uh, my ex-sister-in-law at the time, she was an emergency room doctor in Orlando, Florida, and she was driving over. She got the call to come say goodbye to me. And as she was driving over, she was on the highway and she felt like she heard from the Lord that I was supposed to be on something called the ECMO machine. I don't know if you've ever heard of the ECMO machine. I had never heard of the ECMO machine at that time. I'll tell you what it is in just a minute. But she arrived at the hospital and she told the doctors and the nurses that she believed I needed to be on the ECMO machine. Well, she had a little clout behind her because she was an emergency room doctor, right? So they, they listened to her. But they also told her, as soon as she said I needed to be on an ECMO machine, they let her know that they did not have an ECMO machine at that hospital. So that was a little confusing. Like, why would you just hear from the Lord that that I needed to be on the ECMO machine and and (laughs) I'm at a hospital that doesn't have one. But they did let my family know at that time, but we are at the end of our rope with this guy. We're minute by minute. We don't know what we're gonna do. So if you believe he needs to be on an ECMO machine, we will initiate a transfer to any hospital uh, that you would like. So they sat down and on New Year's Eve, December 31st, 2019, in doing their research, they found that there were only seven hospitals in the entire state of Florida that had an ECMO machine. One of them happened to be back in Orlando, Florida. So they told them that and they initiated that transfer. And at 11 p.m. on December 31st, New Year's Eve, literally one hour before everyone on the East Coast was about to scream and cheer and celebrate, Happy New Year. I'm being shoved into a helicopter to be life flighted from one hospital to another. It's my only helicopter ride. I don't even remember it. I arrived at the, at the hospital in Orlando. It was around 1 a.m. on January 1st, 2020. The best year of all of our lives. 
I'm just a very competitive person, so I got a head start to all of our crappy lives of 2020, right? So I beat you to the punch there. Uh, so I arrived at 1 a.m. on January 1st, 2020. They get me out of the helicopter. Go with me here. They get me out of the helicopter on the helipad. They rushed me into the hospital, into the ICU unit, into the spot where my bed was going to be. They rehooked me up to the exact same 46 machines that I was on at the other hospital. They confirmed the 1.7% chance to live. And then they looked at me and they looked at my family and they said, why is this guy here? And that's when my family told them, well, we're here because we believe that Gary needs to be on the ECMO machine and the hospital he was at didn't have one. You guys have one. We believe that he needs to be on the ECMO machine. And before they could finish that sentence, they looked at them and said, well, Gary's not a candidate for the ECMO machine. Like What? Why would we hear from the Lord that I needed to be on one just to be at a hospital that didn't have one, just to go to another hospital that has one and they're telling me I'm not a candidate for it? Why would I go from this hospital to that hospital just to die here and now leave my family with all of these extra medical bills from the the helicopter ride and all of that stuff? But they assured my family and they gave them the sentence, but we'll make him as comfortable as possible. The phrase that nobody wants to hear as a family. Now here's my disclaimer right here. I was in an induced coma at this point. Everything that I'm telling you right now could be a complete lie. I have no idea. I slept through all this. This is just what they told me that happened. So I'm telling you the same thing. Uh, So so there's that. Uh, So they told my family they would make me as comfortable as possible now. And I was minute by minute. Now if you know anything about hospitals, you know that 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. every day are shift change times, right? So 7 a.m. rolls around, I'm still alive, I'm, my heart's still beating. 7 a.m. comes around, the day shift crew comes and clocks in, and the night shift crew, the first thing they do is they make their rounds, right? If any of you works in a hospital or been there, they make the day shift crew makes their rounds about the patients that they're going to have, kind of get the lay of the land, what they're up against for the day. The night shift crew kind of lets them know, you know, this guy's here for that, that guy's here for that, so on and so forth. And they're, they're at my bed. Literally, they're at my bed making their rounds. The night shift crew is talking to the day shift crew about me and why I was there. And while they were talking to me at 7.18 a.m. on January 1st, 2020, all 46 machines that I was connected to at the same time in unison all went beep. Code blue started coming all over the speakers. While they were at the foot of my bed, I laid there and died. They said it was just like out of the movies. My whole body within 30 seconds turned blue. This little 70 pound nurse, probably soaking wet, just jumps on top of my body and just starts King Kong in my chest to try to bring anything back that they could. They did everything they could. They used the defibrillator, you know, the one, two, three, clear shot. And they were in such an emergency that, that they, they used that defibrillator on me and they were, they were trying to go so quickly, they didn't put the pads down. So I have giant burn scars on me right now from when they shocked me. And at 7.29 a.m., just before they started giving up on their resuscitation efforts, one of the doctors and nurses looked up at one of the machines and they found a slight pulse. I don't know, God either didn't want me or he wasn't done with me yet. I don't know which one of the two, so. Uh, They found a slight pulse. At this time, the doctors and the nurses, they go out into the waiting room where the rest of my family and my friends were, and they go out into the waiting room and my family just starts screaming, like, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. They knew that the doctors were going to tell them that I was gone. At that time, the cardiothoracic surgeon who was on call all night Uh, joined them while they were walking out into the waiting room. And while the doctors and nurses were letting my family and friends know that they found a slight pulse in me, the cardiothoracic surgeon interjected and she said, listen, I have no idea what's going on here. I'm just getting caught up to the case. I don't even know who Gary is, but but I know what just happened to him. I know he died for 11 minutes and they they brought him back and there's a slight pulse. We don't know what we're going to do, but I'm going to throw up a Hail Mary and put him on something called the ECMO machine. Come on, God. 
So they rushed me back into surgery to connect me to the ECMO machine. And what, the way the ECMO machine works is it, it runs two lines on either side of my groin. Anybody want to see the scars? <laughs> Just kidding. You're sick, people. So it runs two lines, one on either side of my scar up into my heart. Now what the ECMO machine does and, and why I was not a candidate for it is the ECMO machine is a form of life support that people are put on after they receive a heart transplant or a lung transplant. Well, on paper, I didn't receive a heart transplant or a lung transplant, so I wasn't a candidate. If you're looking at policy over people, they got it right. I was not a candidate for the ECMO machine. But praise God for this one cardiothoracic surgeon who looked at people over policy and threw up a Hail Mary to put me on it. So they put me on that and uh, amen. Yeah, yeah, come on, clap for that, people. Yeah, come on, give it to God. Amen. So they put me on this and, and the way that the ECMO machine works is it takes all of the blood, all of the oxygen, all of the circulation from your entire body and it pumps it into your core to keep your other organs running strong while your new heart or your new lungs kick in. Well, doctors are pretty good at what they do. Most people are on the ECMO machine for about 24 hours, 48 at most. But 24 hours is the standard until your new heart or new, your new lungs kick in. Well, I was in a coma from January 1st until January 10th for 10 days. So I was on the ECMO machine for 10 days, which means all of the blood, all of the oxygen, all of the circulation from my entire body was pumped into my core and my extremities weren't receiving any. So my arms and legs started dying. Uh, there were two medical terms that they used to describe my extremities, my arms and my legs. The first one was necrotic. It's a fairly known medical term, right? My, my, my skin, my tissue, my muscles, everything inside just started dying. It started becoming necrotic. My arms and legs were pitch black and hard as a rock. You could take a hammer and hit my arms and it would sound like you were hitting concrete. Um, the second medical term that they used to describe my extremities, which I, I didn't know was a medical term at the time, was mummified. I was turning into a mummy. Now, if there's a way to go. <laughs> what a cool story for my boys, right? My dad was a mummy. What was yours? Oh, a salesman? <laughs> so they said, they said it was mummified. And while I was in my coma, my family had to make a decision on my behalf. Uh, there's no way that my body would have been able to take another round of infection, another round of septic shock or multi-system organ failure. So the decision was made on my behalf. Do we lose his life or does he lose his limbs? And my family looked at them and said, we'll take him back however you can give him to us. So I'm in my coma. They did not do the amputations right then and there. They waited a little while. I'll tell you about that in just a second. But I was in my coma and, and I woke up from my coma on January 10th and I will never ever forget it. I remember cracking my eyes open for the very first time on January 10th. And nobody knew at that time, one, if I was ever going to wake up. If I was going to wake up, was I going to be brain dead? Was I just gonna be a vegetable? Or was I gonna wake up and be okay? Nobody knew that. So on January 10th, I crack my eyes open for the first time and I see my mom's face. I mean, right there. It's the first way I came into the world too, so I guess I might as well be the second. And I just remember thinking in that moment like, oh dear God, please put me back into that coma. <laughs> just kidding. Love you, mom. So I wake up and I look at me and I am, what? I start learning of the gravity of my situation. I start looking at my body. At this time, I couldn't speak. I lost my vocal cords. A week later, they had to perform a tracheotomy on me to poke a hole in my throat to put that little device in there to give me the ability to speak again. I vowed in that moment that if I ever did get my voice fully back, all I ever wanted to do was speak. Yes. So here I am. So I start learning the gravity of my situation and now I start learning that I have to get my arms and legs cut off. <laughs> what? Man, I love sports. I was a two-time, here I go, my glory days. 
I was a two-time back-to-back state champion in the four by 800 meters in track and field in the state of Florida. I was the head coach of my kids' soccer teams and my boys' football teams all growing up as they were, as they were growing up. And now you gotta cut my arms and my legs off? Like, who am I gonna be? What's my identity gonna look like now? So I'm learning all of this stuff, and, and then and on March 18th, I wake up in the morning and they come in and they say, all right, Gary, there's a little infection starting to set in on your arms. We need to take you back and take them off. I promise you guys this. I am not some super Christian. I'm not gonna be the guy that's just gonna give you the Sunday school answers to everything. I'm not gonna speak that Christianese language that we sometimes speak here in the church. But the only thing that came to my mind in that moment And I remember looking up at my dad before they wheeled me back to get my hands amputated. Was the verse in the book of Job, which if you've never read the book of Job, don't. (laughs) It's awful. Just kidding. It was the verse in the book of Job, chapter one, verse 21. And whether you're a Christian or not, you've probably heard this verse. It says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And in that moment, In that moment, I knew for 39 years in my life, the Lord had given me hands. But right now it was taking away time. And I spent my whole life telling people that God is good and preaching people that God is good and trying to convince other people that God is good. So how dare I, now that something traumatic is happening to my life, live like he's not? And thank God that verse doesn't end there because it says the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. So whether he's giving, whether he's taken away, blessed be his name. All right, listen, that's my, st- all right, here we go. That's, that's, that's a portion of my medical story. If you wanna know more, I, Google it, all right? Um, but this is where I wanna flip the script. I only have a couple minutes left. But this is where I wanna flip the script onto you guys. And here's what I do know. Here's what I have learned. Here's what I found out. At the end of the day, every single one of us, we're all struggling with something. Every single one of us. If you're not right now, good for you. Buckle up. (laughs) But every single one of us has a struggle. And I'm gonna venture to say that the only difference between me and you right now is that my struggles are visible. You can see them. You can see how hard it is for me to do things. If you go out to lunch with me after services today and while we're eating, there's a really good chance that while we're eating, I'm gonna drop my fork. (laughs) It's a hands thing, people, You, you wouldn't understand but I would drop my fork. And I guarantee you that if you were sitting next to me and if you saw me drop my fork, you would bend down and pick that fork up and you would hand it back to me. If you wouldn't, you're a horrible person. (laughs) But I guarantee you that every single one of you, if you saw me do that, probably with joy in your heart and a smile on your face, you would bend down and pick up that fork and hand it back to me because you would see my struggle. But if I don't know what your struggle is, then I don't know how to pick up your fork and hand it back to you. Because we have that mask on. It's fine. I'm fine. Fine as fine can be. And what I've learned is that the invisible struggles where mine are visible, oh, trust me, I got plenty of my invisible ones too. But what I've learned is those invisible struggles will kill you more than septic shock. They will kill you more than multi-system organ failure. They will eat you alive from the inside out. But we've learned to hide. We've learned to have that mask on. We've learned to attempt to manage our stuff 
to manage our sin. And this goes back to the very beginning. Y'all listen, listen, Adam and Eve were in that garden, right? They took a bite of that fruit and the very first thing they did was they made clothes for themselves. They wanted to hide. They wanted to cover themselves up. This is the very first record of sin management in scripture. And then what did they do? When Jesus was walking down the, 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 the way there, down the path, and he's calling out for them, where were they? Hiding in the stinking bushes. So they covered themselves up and they hid. Who's doing that today? Who's got their mask on today? You? You? Society tells us every which way how we're supposed to be. Women, I'm gonna talk to you for just a second. Women, if nobody has told you today or this week or this month or this year yet, let me be the first. You are beautiful. You are absolutely beautiful just the way you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Society tells you how tall you're supposed to be, what your hair color is supposed to look like, how thin you're supposed to be. Society will destroy you. But Jesus did not mess up on you. Jesus didn't make a mistake on me. You are beautiful. Men, you are not beautiful. <laughs> Some of you are a little pretty. I'll give you that. But men, we don't cheer each other on enough. We don't look at another man in the eyes and say, hey, you're the man. Women, you are beautiful. Men, you're the man. We can find anything on this planet to argue about. Wasn't it just a couple years ago we were all arguing about whether a dress was gold or blue or something stupid like that on social media? Like, we can find anything to argue about. We are entering into a political season. I'm not going there. But we are entering into a political season where there's just complete division ahead of us. We can find anything to argue about. But the only thing that you cannot argue with me about is my story and what Jesus Christ has done in me. My testimony. The only thing I can't argue with you about is what Jesus Christ has done in you and your testimony. So let's just go out there and talk about that. Let's just go out there and talk about what Jesus is up to. Find where the Holy Spirit is moving and join him there. I believe that we serve a do it again God. I believe that, that, that on the very first day that he and only he can tell the sun when to shine. And that very first day when he had that sunrise, I believe that he looked at it and he was like, man, that is beautiful. I'm gonna do it again. And he popped up one of the very first flowers ever way back then. And he was like, whoa, that is stinking beautiful. I'm going to do that a million times over. And I believe that he can look down on us when we take off that mask and we tell someone who we really are, what we're really struggling with, what we really looked at on the internet yesterday that joke that we told, that person that we made fun of. I believe that when we tell somebody that, when we tell somebody who we really are, what we're really struggling with, that Christ is looking down on you with a smile on his face 10 miles wide saying, do that again. Do it again. Now I'm not talking about going outside with a banner and, and, and shouting from the rooftops all your crap all your stuff, but I'm begging you guys with all of my heart. Listen, what if there was a place that was so safe that the very worst of you could be known? 
and you would find out that you were loved more for the sharing of it and not judged. My prayer for you is that you guys can't even fall asleep tonight. I pray the weight of the world is on your shoulders tonight until you can either roll over or pick up your phone and call or text or direct message somebody that one thing. Earlier when I said we all got struggles, something came to your mind. Something popped up. You know what it is. Jesus knows what it is. You ain't, you ain't hiding it from him. But my prayer is that you will find that one person that you can roll over and say, this is what's going on in my life. Let me take my mask off because I want to feel loved, not my mask. Throw that mask away. Yes. COVID's over. Come on. I was in New York City a couple months after I got out of the hospital. I was invited to an all-amputee fashion show. So I was in New York City uh, going to this fashion show. They take 20 uh, amputees across the country every year and they invite them in to tell their stories and, and, and walk, the, walk the runway. And, and I did that. And it was the night before uh, that, that uh, fashion show. We were doing a dress rehearsal and we had a dinner. And, and one of the amputees actually developed a wound on his leg and, and he was unable, because of that wound, he was unable to put his prosthetic on so he couldn't participate in the fashion show the next day. And I went over and I checked on him and I was talking with him. I was like, man, what's going on? He's like, man, I'm just having a bad day. And I looked at him and I was like, I don't want to have any more of those. I don't want any more of those. No more bad days. Listen, if Christ's mercies are new, if scripture is real, if that part is real, if Christ's mercies are new every day, then I can lay my head on my pillow at the end of the day. Listen, we're gonna have tough situations, hard times. There's gonna be bad circumstances that come up in our lives. But if Christ's mercies are new every day, then we can lay our head on our pillow at the end of the day and say, as a whole, this is no more, I'm no more bad days. You know, I was able to, I was able to tell my story. Actually, you can't see it, but I, I have a tattoo on me right here and, and it's an EKG line. It's an actual screenshot of my flat line from 718 AM on January 1st. And that's my very first heartbeat that came back. And I have the date on it, January 1st, 2020. And right underneath it, it says, no more bad days. I don't wanna have any more of those. And I'm able to be freed from the bad days because of my village, because of the people that I trust enough in my life that I can share who I really am with and it's not hurting me from the inside out anymore because it's out there. If sin and struggle find its power when it's hidden, when you let it out with at least one person, then it's not hidden anymore. Right. It loses its power. But I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. So if that's you here this morning and you're not there yet, if you haven't found that courage or that bravery to be able to tell someone what's going on, you'll get there. But in the meantime, my, my shameless plug here, if you go to GaryMiracle.com, there's a tab on top that says no more bad days. You click on that, email me. I promise you I'll respond. I promise you I'll respond. Let me know what your struggle is. But don't go to sleep tonight without sharing it with somebody. Take the mask off, church. This world has enough hypocrisy. This world has enough junk. And if you are Christ in you, if that is really true, then you have the full, yeah, he didn't hold anything back from you. You have the full power and authority of Jesus Christ himself living inside of you, fused with every fiber of your being. You are Christ in you. That is who you are. If you are not a Christian this morning, if you don't have any idea what I'm talking about, 
Scripture is very specific about what it takes to do that. You believe in your heart that Jesus is who he says he is and God raised him from the dead. And you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you shall be saved. You don't need to ask for forgiveness. That was done, that was paid for. When you believe in your heart, when you confess with your mouth, forgiveness is your gift. For everything you've done, for everything you're doing, for everything that's ahead of you that you're going to do, and you will no longer just be some saved sinner. You will be a saint who sometimes still sins because of Christ in you. I invite you to that moment today. If, listen, it says in scripture, oh, I gotta hurry. Uh, it says in scripture that nobody knows the day or the hour, right, when Jesus is going to return. Now, I'm, I'm not gonna sit up here and pretend like I do, so don't, 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 don't worry about that. But I think I know the situation. I believe that scripture says that at the end, there's a Lamb's book of life and our names are written down in that Lamb's book of life. And I believe that as soon as that last name accepts Jesus and confesses him as Lord, as soon as that last person does it, we're out of here. There's no reason to keep us here at that point. So is that you? Are we waiting on you? Because I'm going to go to heaven and I'm going to get hands and legs back and I'm going to be running down those streets of gold as fast as I possibly can. So if that's you here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, what if you're that last person? What if you're that person we're waiting for? Listen, help me get to heaven. Say that prayer. Get to know Jesus. Just to selfishly do it for me. But that's my prayer for you guys. Listen, I have, I have more uh, stories, more details. I, I had the opportunity to write a book. Uh, the book is called No More Bad Days. Shock. Um, but I, I have a table set up right out here, and, and, I, and I'm, I have those books for sale. But now listen, I'm not saying that you have to buy a book in order to get into heaven. <laughs> but why risk it? Why take that chance? Just in case it's 20 bucks, just, you know, just seal your deal. Y'all, if I can have the honor of just praying over you guys this morning, God, Lord, you know us through and through and through. You know who we are. You know what we're going through, what we're struggling with. You know what we have the courage to tell other people. You know what, what the courage and bravery we, bravery we have to be vulnerable. God, I pray that your power that is in us gives us the ability to rip our mask off today. I say it doesn't matter what I'm going through. No hands, no feet, no excuses. Our invisible struggles are not excuses to not seek you with everything that we got. God, let this church change the world. Let this church be the reason that one day we can once again say we are one nation under God. Let it start right here, right now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Church, let's continue to stand. And I wanna do this really quick. Isn't it wonderful to see that in any situation, God can work, God can move, God can use it. And you see our brother Gary out here and you go, this is a God who is a God of hope. And we're not promised tomorrow 
But when we put our faith and we put our trust in Jesus, we do have the hope of heaven where there will be no more bad days. It's incredible what God can do. And maybe you're not in a hospital room, but like Gary was saying, you're just struggling with something right now. With every head bow, do this for me and every eye closed. I just want you to think just for a minute, is there something right here right now I want to give to God? And maybe for some of you, it's, I wanna give him my life. I wanna give him, I want him in my heart. I want him as my savior. I need something from him right now. And if that's you, I just want you to tell him that. Do that very thing. Confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. And from every day here on out, you're going to commit to live your life, this new life that he'll give you for his honor, for his glory. Trust that he has saved you. you're doing that right now I want to pray for you if you're doing that right now would you raise your hand I see your hand I see your hand God right now I pray that you would give our brothers and sisters this assurance that you hear us when we call you and that right now, God, you're near, you're here, you're listening, and you're giving new life to people right now. You're not making bad people good. You are bringing the dead to life right here, right now, God. You are making hearts alive. Let them know that right now. And for anybody else who might be wrestling, maybe with some habits, maybe with some, some secrets, some things that have been just, just hanging out for f too long. God, again, it's like our brother said, your mercies are new every morning. You give us the opportunity to come to you, to bring these things into the light. Help us not to be afraid, God, but to trust that you'll heal us. You'll strengthen us. If we'll just come to you. We can trust you. Thank you, God, for this opportunity right here, right now, to hear this testimony, to be together, to worship you, God, to be encouraged by all that you are. What a great and wonderful God you are to us. Right now, we're just gonna sing your praises in gratitude and thanksgiving. And as a challenge, God, for us to live for you. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Let's sing, church.
is so good. He's with you. He loves you. He's for you. God bless you. Have a great week.